Welcome everybody. Today we are talking about prevention. Uh, the uh, chairman of this session will be Gregor Burkert, uh, who will also introduce our participants today. Um, thank you, Gregor, for taking the floor. Thank you. So this is the introduction to our webinar today. It is based on and done with people we know from our European prevention curriculum training. So all of them are master trainers here. And it's about the role that such a training can have in advocacy. We all have seen the problems raising now from in, in COVID times, how little it matters that we have the science and the facts if we do not have a proper narrative for it and can communicate this. So I hope that now we have some opening remarks by our director if he has entered already. Otherwise, if he is not, Marika, I will- I cannot see him yet. Probably he's taken by some other commitment. So I think we can advance and then uh, check up later, okay? Okay, so we will first have uh, a twin presentation by our two European UPC master trainers. Maximil Maximilian von Heiden in Berlin is a public health researcher and prevention practitioner with a background in social work and research experience in the field of medical psychology and sexology. He's the editor of a handbook, Psychoactive Substances, published by Springer. Uh, co-founder and board member of Finder, the Mind Foundation, and research fellow at the Institute of Sexology and Sexual Medicine at the famous Charité, the Univers University Clinic of Berlin. And Trin from Estonia focuses her work on mental health and risk behavior prevention. And she has long experience with facilitating public health, present conversations with teachers, parents, employers, and decision makers on complex topics beyond drugs, such as HIV, sex education, alcohol. And she has a background in adult education and is working in the National Institute for Health Development in Estonia, with whom we cooperate a lot generally and is involved with Health Estonia Foundation. I think now, I think Max, begin, you have your 15 minutes and then switch over to Trin, I have introduced you both. Afterwards, we will have some questions to the other three stakeholders here, which we with whom you should engage also in question and answers and, and debate questions. Max? Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Gregor. Um, thank you also very much for the opportunity and invitation to speak about this important topic, namely advocacy for science-based prevention. Um, we said this evidence doesn't speak for itself. And uh, thank you also for giving reference to the COVID-19 pandemic, which is uh, a great example for the importance of advocacy. I'd like to begin my talk about advocacy by um, putting it in the larger framework of public health. And um, I have quoted from the Oxford textbook of public health, um, a very simple, but also very useful definition of public health, which says public health is politics. It is political in that its policies and practices affect the very rights, liberties and duties of not only me and you, but also of numerous public and private stakeholders from public servants and corporations to healthcare providers and citizens. We must also recognize that most practical achievements of public health and the related research have been funded and sustained by governments and public institutions, not necessarily voluntarily, but also as a result of public health advocacy. While some of you may have considered this definition from the Oxford textbook to be bold and maybe overly reductionist, the current pandemic has made the deep intertwining of politics and public health very obvious and also its uh, strong impact on our very daily lives. Since advocacy is the conceptual framework, the mindset 
and also kind of an attitude, a toolkit that helps us to translate scientific findings into political action. Simon Chapman was probably right when he said, it is the neglected sibling of public health. Comparing, for example, the achievements of um, advocacy with um, yeah, its visibility and um, uh, yeah, recognition in the public discourse. So what is advocacy? Um, it is the act of arguing or pleading in favor of an issue or an idea that is thought to enhance the well-being of another person, a group or a population. So I am advocating for advocacy with you at the moment so that you become advocates for a good purpose. <laughs> in the field of drug prevention, the goal of advocacy is to create conditions that are conducive to health. And since the determinants of health are multi-sectoral and also the determinants of drug-related disorders, advocacy too must extend well beyond just the health sector. So for example, it is also a means of social affairs. It may involve parent organizations and parent empowerment. It is a very broad communicative strategy and also a recognized essential public health operation. The WHO just recently released the 10 essential or defined the 10 essential public health operations and advocacy is uh, part of two of them. And the WHO states public health evidence base is stronger than ever before. But with that statement in mind, considering the wealth of scientific findings and their promises, one may wonder that we still do not have achieved the UN Sustainable Development Goals, neither in Europe nor globally. And one may also wonder that prevention practice in Europe, although prevention is recognized as something important in the drugs field, is not necessarily science-based yet. So part of the problem is the neglect of advocacy. And many scientific findings, especially those without economic value, are hardly or never recognized or understood by politicians and the general public. Well, one reason may be that discourse in academic and public health circles is disciplined by principles of evidence and critical appraisal, fortunately. <laughs> but publishing in scientific journals does not necessarily mean that anybody will ever read it or cite it, and it will be hardly recognized by the general public or um, outside the scientific community by politicians, for example. Most people actually state that they inform themselves through the media. So if your scientific findings are not reported in the media, they won't be recognized normally. So the con by contrast to the academic public health discourse, the currency of advocacy is metaphor using analogies, symbols, and also efforts to present data in ways that are resonant and memorable to inexpert target audiences. It is about connecting values that have a widespread support with your findings so that people understand and also have an emotional connection to why the solutions proposed to problems are important and relevant. One value that prevention has successfully been connected to in the past, for example, is that of economics. Whilst there may be no economic value in conducting prevention activities on first sight, obviously high costs are involved if no preventative actions are taken. So this, for example, um, is one important value um, to appeal to. Another important value, and I think in the history of humankind, this is um, really new and, and giving hope, is that for the first time during this COVID-19 pandemic, the value of health has been put above economic interests on a global scale. So what strategies do we have and do we know so that we can inform our advocacy? Well, there are five very important ones and the overarching theme is that it involves campaigning for political, regulatory or organizational change either on the local, the district, the national or even on the international level. I think it is very important not to confuse advocacy with mere publicity. 
if there are no conflicting interests, then there's no point in just you know arguing for something. But especially in the drugs field, this is more difficult. Advocacy is also not lobbying, although often confused. Um, while some organizations may lobby for or against a specific law to pursue their agenda, advocacy transcends one's own interests and also the interests of the organization. It is really arguing for a common good that goes just beyond uh, personal or, or organizational interests. It becomes important advocacy when interests collide. So, for example, let's have a look at um, cannabis regulation and legalization. The cannabis industry may be interested in an unregulated market, whilst prevention practitioners or psychiatrists may be interested in a more regulated form of legalization. So here is it where advocacy comes into play. And it is also important to remind that the analytical sophistication possessed by most politicians and funding bureaucrats that whom we may address will rarely require any venturing into the complexities of the philosophy of science. <laughs> so um, such people need and want usually two paragraph answers to difficult questions like, do these school programs work? Or will banning advertising reduce demand? And they are often kind of slaves to simplify decision-making processes as part of the political process that conspire against the very nature of scientific research and the highly intertwined nature of the results that are achieved. So how can we inform our strategy? How do we, how can we better understand the political cycle? Um, this framework is very old. It's actually, it was actually proposed by Leswell in 1956, and it is not a theoretical framework in so far as that it um, predicts certain outcomes, but it is very useful and still used a lot in order to better understand the policy process and also to understand in, even if just one stage is, um, you know, trying to be influenced through an advocacy stra uh, strategy, like what may go wrong during the process or where opponents of our strategy might try to intervene. So for example, agenda setting, like bringing something on the agenda, making people, politicians aware of the importance of a certain issue, maybe through a report or a statement, um, a press statement issued by, for example, the European Society for Prevention Research may lead to agenda setting, or it may influence the evaluation of a current practice. For example, the current prevention activities conducted in a certain community, district, or country. So with this framework in mind, it becomes easier to understand like what strategies might be pertinent to take influence. But before I continue, um, I would like to ask you whether you have made some experience with um, um, advocacy in general. Let me just reset the results here. Please take your mobile if you have one uh, or go to a browser, go to menti.com and type in the code up here. This is an anonymous survey. I'm just really curious whether you have used the policy cycle or not if you ever try to influence one of these stages. You can also um, pick multiple ones if you have uh, experience in several of these stages. Just checking myself. So one may go beyond just merely having the policy cycle in mind when thinking of creating an advocacy plan or an advocacy strategy. One thing I, I would like to add to what I said before is that it, advocacy comes with a huge degree of responsibility because integrity is a major part of the scientific endeavor. Acknowledging ignorance and informing your work through 
a set of values. And this is not necessarily always the case with your opponents. And it is easy to become to fall victim to temptations of giving under complex answers to very complex issues. So goodwill is not enough. And it really also depends on a certain attitude and mindset, whether you are an advocate with integrity and a scientific mindset. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy that it works. We already have 70 answers. And I'm also uh, quite happy to see that many of you already try to take influence on several or some of the policy cycle stages. So maybe I didn't tell you news this morning, but um, I find it very encouraging. So let's move on in the few minutes that remain for me and have a look on theories of change. Because if we advocate for science-based prevention, we would probably um, be informed well or advised well to apply evidence to our advocacy as well. So I won't dive deep into the uh, definition of theories of change, but I want to make clear, while advocacy is very interesting, many people may ask, can you prove to me that it actually works? And this is not working in a laboratory where you can clearly define the outcomes and the influencing factors, but it is by contrast working outside in the real world in um, where you try to penetrate and repeatedly respond to decision-making environments that can literally change by the hour during periods of intense campaigning. That doesn't make it impossible to evaluate but it makes it really, uh, relatively difficult compared to, for example, pharmaceutical research in a very controlled setting. That being said, there are many theories that we can rely on. Some are global, more global theories, some are more tactical theories, some stem from social and communication psychology, others from policy research. But I would like to advise all of you who are interested in this topic to dive a little deeper, I will also provide um, a list of um, advice literature afterwards and have a look at, for example, the grassroots theory or media influence theory, because this can be very useful to become efficient and also to have a means of evaluating whether the strategy you have will lead to some results. So thank you very much. Um, so far, because I, you know, I would love to have told some stories, but I would like to hand over to my colleague Trin, um, who will dive a bit more into the question of how do you actually become an advocate? Trin, you have the floor now. Trin, you have the floor, and I think Gus Grutz, who asked. How do you educate policymakers if evidence-based prevention contradicts their strong convictions has been partly answered by Max already, and maybe Trine will answer it now in more practical terms. Go ahead, Trine. I don't know if I have the uh, really thorough answer to this. I don't know if anyone has, but thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon from my part as well. Thank you, Max, for your talk show. So engaging always. I wish we had more time to discuss the theories a bit more to hear all of your stories and experience. But I'm here today to explore the nature of an advocate in prevention. So who is this person? How to become one? Um, and please, uh, you can comment in the chat. I'm sure Gregor looks into it all the time. Uh, so I believe it, it's um, wise uh, to keep in mind that advocacy is not so much about intervention as communication. As Max said, many scientific findings, uh, especially those without economic value or with vague economic value, are hardly or never recognized or understood by politicians and decision makers. So prevention is one of those topics where outcomes and goals seem so far away and vague uh, that without making uh, the topic simpler is a challenging to be hurt, get hurt. So in prevention, our goal 
our end goal is uh, to see or inflict change in behavior and we know that this can take years. So it's really hard to make the decision, the decision makers uh, to see uh, what they can do in this short policy cycle. And how does this change happen? You need to influence both the social norms as well the environment where we live, the laws and regulations, because new structures allow people to think and behave in new ways. Uh, and it makes it possible for people to adapt new behaviors. And I think advocacy is a strong tool uh, to affect those changes. And as Max already said, we need to consider at the policy cycle and understand that the reality is often messy and constantly changing. I see Max nodding. You agree with me? And uh, the cycle is often too short to recognize bigger changes in public health and, and decision makers, especially in local level. They want to see clear cut goals. So what is achievable in the next four years, depending on the country, the cycle uh, length. So, so we need to kind of answer those questions in our strategies. And uh, how do we use this in our favor? Uh, I think one question is also, uh, are, are people ready to listen? Are the opinion makers ready? We need to test this. Uh, where are we in our stage? And uh, I think Gregor already pointed out and Max that our current situation in the world uh, makes us a perfect window of opportunity because what we see now in the world is the moment uh, prevention wise that uh, we see worldwide attention to mental health. And this is an excellent opportunity to advocate on behalf of uh, drug prevention and risk behavior prevention, because the same interventions help us in both fields. So sometimes it's good to make these connections and to see the wider picture where our strategy fit in. So political climate is at the moment is in favor of prevention. And we can try to make change and bridge the gap in between science and policy. So the next question would be, do we know how, we, how to talk to people about it? How and who to talk to about it? Do we need to talk to general public, decision makers, policy makers? Who is our target group? Uh, and I also quote again, Max. <laughs> You said that, uh, you pointed out that not many people read scientific papers, guidelines, instructions. It's so true. So when we only make those, who will benefit from it? We, we need to make people heard. What tools can we use? And Gregor already said that we use this, uh, our European prevention curriculum uh, for to invite different parties to the, uh, to the shared table to discuss those um, wicked problems and uh, interdisciplinary uh, questions. So, but I want to do a little reflection task and uh, I wish to ask all of you who are now listening and thinking along, think about when you were involved somewhere and you truly felt hurt, involved, you had the chance to affect something, you were able to express your thoughts. Please post in the chat so I can reflect on that later. And let's take a couple of seconds so you have time to think when you were heard, when you felt, and what made this feeling or possible? What was in the process that made you feel you could express yourself? One, three, five. So in my experience, decision and opinion makers often have ideas, they have their constructs and they wish to be heard as well. So by listening, being humble, uh, we will know what are their beliefs, attitudes, fears, goals. And we can make all the knowledge that we have relatable and simpler, uncomplicated. But there are things, uh, some things to keep in mind. I think, uh, for example, the goal setting and message design which already Max reflected and I also said before, because prevention, prevent, 
question examples can be vague or polarizing or just too scientific. So we need to remember that results or that our message needs to be achievable and understandable. I also want to explore the polarizing topic a bit more because I have seen where we have had our experience that it's hard for people to come along when they feel stupid or when they feel cornered. So the question is, how do we make them to think along in new ideas when um, when the practice has been something else, uh, harmful, ineffective? And we see this happening in our uh, trainings as well, or uh, when we discuss the, these um, ineffective or uh, harmful practices. And people struggle to find new ways to accept the data, the evidence, which is uh, sometimes undisput undisputable. And but by facilitating these discussions, by listening, by asking the right questions, they finally find their own way of this new thinking. Uh, one thing that we discussed before when we were preparing for this uh, webinar with Max, we also agreed that being an advocate does not mean that you have to know everything, that you have to be fluent in everything, in every topic. It's rather that you need to be able to explain complex constructs and uh, these wicked problems in various ways, simple ways, to, uh, let pe to make people hear you, to think along you. And the uh, other thing that we discussed was that not everything can be controlled. So it's important to letting go. Uh, I think that we all have seen that sometimes policy cycle is not always in our favor. So what do we do? We have those different questions uh, that the policymakers don't listen or our institutional, um, we are not strong enough in our organization. Our ideas are not strong enough. Uh, the public opinion doesn't get uh, come along. Uh, there is no demand for good prevention. So how can we make change in that? Uh, the existing political administrative system, is it or is it not in our favor? Uh, when we have it, we can use it as much as we can. And also the experts, the facts, the science, when is the time for these? And how can, uh, how can we, we make the policymakers to want to hear more from the experts? And how can we teach or learn uh, ourselves as experts to, to speak more clearly, to speak more engagingly? Um, we have to accept that the change takes time and it's constant, and especially an advocacy process. You can think of strategy for next two years, five years, but you have to be able to adapt so it means creating allies, uh, not being territorial, being um, creating trust, uh, making opportunities for others to take responsibility, speaking with people. I think that practicing uh, uh, speaking, facilitating, asking questions is something that we can all benefit from. How we have all these experiences that when the topic is polarizing, you make mistakes. Some people get angry. They are not agreeing with you so what can i learn from that i think advocacy is a lot about that um, we have seen in estonia that uh, we want to achieve the shared understanding of prevention we want to see the th uh, that we agree on theory we want to see interdisciplinary and cross-sectoral approach uh, it has been taking us for six years we constantly adapt in our process uh, create new allies, coalitions, uh, to work towards that. But we also know uh, that you can have great interventions in different various settings, in schools, in workplaces, in family settings. But when you don't have the advocacy uh, as part of your strategy, so what happens? You perhaps you lose your funding or there is no demand for these uh, great evidence-based setting uh, interventions. Uh, people don't know the practitioners are not familiar with it. So all this can be part of your strategy. 
And uh, I think the last part would be that how do I evaluate that? Because so, uh, a lot of times that focus is very vague and it's like talking to people and how do I know that I have gotten somewhere? So where do we change, uh, see change? First, we can see uh, change in demand, social norms. We see that you as a person or as an uh, organization have more credibility. You have more leverage. You create stronger allies, coalitions. People come behind this topic of our uh, prevention. Uh, you see the support from general public. Uh, and after a time, you see better decisions on policy level. But it does take time. It doesn't come tomorrow. You get tired. Uh, you need to um, reflect, learn. And this is a great opportunity for me to uh, reflect on my uh, experience. But uh, I think the question at the end is, uh, what are the most important issues in prevention for me? And what can I do to help? How can I uh, make advocacy use? How to make things better? I think I uh, passed my time limit already, uh, but um, I think that uh, uh, a person who is an advocate is also a good listener, uh, is learning to be a good listener, being humble, being open to mistakes and uh, getting the flow of the process. Um, going with the process is so important. Thank you. Green. Yes. Green. Now Marika will have a... Yeah. Yes, a thank you. I've, uh, as you have already noticed, Alexis Gustil, our director, has joined us. He was taken by another fundamental meeting, couldn't leave it before, but I would like it to invite him to say something to our attendees uh, now. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you, Marika. Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, I would like to, to thank very much Maximilian and Trin. They made an excellent presentation. I will not make uh, the comments now, I will keep for the conclusion, but uh, I would like to say two things. The first is that uh, the topic uh, of today is, uh, uh, is a top level priority for EMCDDA. And what I will try to share with you at the end of uh, the webinar is that basically uh, we have uh, many challenges and opportunities in common uh, with those working uh, in the side of advocacy. And the best illustration is that we organize this webinar and we invite you uh, to debate those points. So I think what, uh, what I can say, without pretending we are the best and we do everything perfectly, uh, still, I think in the EU, in the European Union, we are lucky enough that we have uh, both people working on for advocacy, we have people working for prevention, but we have the chance that uh, the legislator has decided to create a European Drug Monitoring Center, because one of the ways in which we can, and we actually do mutually support with each other, is that uh, we have a role to play and we, we, we try to play in the best possible way. We are ready to change the way we play this role, uh, to mutually support, because uh, on the long term, uh, decision makers, uh, I agree with you, decision makers, whatever the level, they don't read science. This is why we don't call them scientists. We call them decision makers. They are just different. They are not bad, they're just different. And one of the main challenges that you and us we have is that we can have the best possible scientific evidence. We don't always uh, ask ourselves, even sometimes before to start to study or research. Okay, but what's the policy question? And what are the things that we could share? And what is the problem that uh, the knowledge we have produced could help them to uh, solve or to address? And basically, and I will leave you uh, reflect on this uh, till the end of this uh, webinar. I think one of the key elements in our approach of decision makers is avoid to use too much the cortex and knowledge that because the first thing that speaks to them is trying to start from emotions. And the more we know, 
the more we have the tendency to balance a big bunch of information that they just cannot process. If we can find some kind of emotion in common and try to see how we can work together uh, starting from that, I think on the very long term, it gives us better chances to get some concrete results. Thank you very much, Alexis. Uh, I will give the floor back to Gregor to go ahead with the webinar and we will wait for the final, the conclusions remarks but by our director in the end. Thank you. You're muted, Gregor. Sorry, I will now give the floor and some questions also here from the question answer session so to some of our stakeholders, which are all master trainers of the UPC in a specific sector in their country. So for now, Ivan Paksic is a specialist in criminalistics and criminology, a lecturer at several faculties in the field of criminology, also several papers focused on crime prevention, award-winning police officer in Croatia, head of the crime prevention department in the Osijek Paranja Police County, and manager of several national crime prevention programs in the Republic of Croatia. So you see, we have managed to get EUPC infiltrated into the law enforcement sector in Croatia, which is great because substance use prevention shares almost all risk factors with crime prevention. Now, Ivan, your question, the first question we have prepared is, given the situation of law enforcement, how can UPC and the advocacy session section help involving the police in evidence-based interventions, such as keeping schools and surroundings safe or enforce legislation about serving or selling to minors, rather than engaging in a typical less evidence-based intervention, such as lecturing students on the danger of substances? Ivan. Thank you, Gregor. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for this opportunity and uh, greetings to everyone present on this online webinar. Uh, in this short time, I will try to explain the role of police in decision making process. Uh, UPC has an important task uh, to focus police work on evidence based interventions and to show the power of influence in decision making. In general, we can say that evidence-based interventions uh, have a proven effectiveness or ineffectiveness. In that way, uh, we should know what to expect from a project or intervention. Uh, if we go from the basis of police work, we can divide it in uh, two separate but uh, linked ways, preventive and repressive. Advocacy and decision-making is, important, uh, is uh, important part of preventive work and is in uh, focus, especially today in modern police. We uh, can also agree that police is an important part of society and as such, part of uh, their preventive work should be, uh, should have participation in uh, prevention interventions and programs that are evidence-based. That also includes evaluation naturally. That is a scientific process and it may seem that it is uh, too complex or maybe too uh, extensive uh, and that it, it is not uh, part of really real police work. But police work is much more than just repression and law enforcement. But we need to ask ourselves, uh, what is effective evidence-based, uh, what uh, if effective uh, evidence-based intervention or project is not enough? what is police role in implementation of evidence-based intervention. We already can hear, hear that police is a crucial part of society. Other decision makers or policy makers should perceive the police as a key public security stakeholder and cooperation is a logical step. If that doesn't happen, police needs to impose as a key stakeholder by drawing attention on the problems in community. To, uh, by open, uh, openly communicate with uh, community and other leaders in community. In that way, police shows that they care. That role comes from fact that police work is public. It is always under public attention. 
Therefore, police work has a great impact on community. Police officers, especially uh, chief uh, police officers, have power to make changes in their community. At the same time, they are, the, they are decision makers, policy makers, and also opinion makers in community. In the context of school as one of the micro level environments that serves as a key institution in shaping children's development, police needs to focus on interventions that can be delivered to a wide range of beneficiaries from that same intervention. Police practice should not be focused only on education, informing about dangers, giving advice, or using various fear tactics. Interventions should be focused on environmental prevention also. On that way, police could enforce policies targeting the use and sale all of, of all substances, including and alcohol, on and near school grounds and at all uh, school-sponsored events. That is something that should be part of universal intervention that focuses on all children without stigmatization. Police can achieve that by directly contacting such places, shops or food bars, something, some places like that, uh, that are close to school, or if the shop is part of the bigger chain, police can contact manager or represent the problem during the meeting. It is also important to involve the school directly. On that meetings should be someone from school, uh, principal, psychologist, or uh, some other uh, person, and uh, there should be some other partners, for example, someone from uh, social welfare service and uh, who are going to represent the problem from their point of view. Police has also impact on parents and on the meetings with parents, police can represent them the problem and to advise them what to do. For example, uh, what are the risks? Uh, that should be done as part of advisory board also. There is also opportunity to communicate with the local community to through crime prevention partnerships. For example, uh, there is uh, one very important partnership in Croatia called Crime Prevention Councils in a local community in which police one is of uh, one of key stakeholders. Uh, in Croatia, police is also a leader in creating coalitions in this community, which can be uh, decision-making partnerships or advocacy partnerships, or maybe some combination of both. Role of police is very important and that can be seen in their universal task, which can be summarized as to protect and serve. And who is going uh, police to protect and serve other than all the citizens, especially the most sensitive ones. In that context, it is possible to initiate legal changes that will prohibit the sale of addictive substances in the school radius. Uh, that process can be viewed as advocacy and from police point of view, general goal is to lower lower number of crime acts and lower, fear, uh, lower, uh, lower level of fear of crime and to make community safer place to live. I can conclude that police has power to make changes alone or in partnership with other community stakeholders. Police can mot motivate community decision makers, but that process takes time. It cannot be done overnight. Trust has a big impact on that process. By using evidence-based intervention, goals uh, can be achieved, but decisions for implementing that kind of intervention is very important. And the police has a big role in that process. Thank you. Now, Ivan, there is still more question, a concrete question by Britt Walsh. How do we address the challenge where politicians want a quick fix and conceptualize prevention as a once-off drugs education? This must be something you are confronted with on a daily basis. Yes, uh, there is something that is, I must say, normal because they usually uh, want a decision yesterday, results today. So that is something that is not possible. Uh, that is something that needs to be explained that it is a process, uh, a process, process that has a beginning, has the middle and has the, has the ending. And it is, uh, as you can watch, or, or as you can uh, watch through the 
crime prevention uh, view, uh, it takes uh, one, two or three years period. So uh, in our point of view, it was very, uh, very, very hard to explain that uh, that is a that is a long time process on a, on a, and for us uh, at the beginning we had a lot of problem with that they expected that something can be fixed right away as you have uh, one crime and you uh, find a person that commits that crime and everything is over in crime prevention it's not like that so as you already know so we had uh, several meetings uh, with uh, politicians on a, a local level so that we need to explain them that we need to start planning now activity in a, in a few months and the results in a few years so it was it is a very uh, very uh, big deal for them because they are always in that uh, election period in Croatia it is four years and in that four years they want the miracles in for a short time uh, so it is not possible. Excellent. Thank you, Ivan. Now let's go to Belgium, to Cynthia Deman, who is another master trainer, but this time from the education field. She's a substance use specialist and the master trainer through our ASA partner project. And she has long experience in training teachers about substance use prevention and supporting schools and developing proper substance use policies in the Flemish part of Belgium. Now, Cynthia, your question is simple, and you all know it. Many schools may prefer short informational approaches, just being put forward as a question, rather than full programs or comprehensive school climate improvement. How can the UPC and the advocacy section in it help schools in making better choices? Cynthia, thank the floor you. is yours. Yeah, thank you, Gregor. Uh, we can't blame schools for wanting short informational approaches. Uh, the people who make decisions about prevention in schools usually aren't experts in prevention science. And intuitive, they might presume that giving information and increasing knowledge about su substances is a good idea. Just like a lot of people falsely think that using scare tactics will convince young people not to use drugs. And the EUPC teaches us that these uh, approaches don't work. Uh, schools will have more results with a multi-component approach. And in Belgium, in, Fl in the Flemish-speaking part, we have a good tradition with installing these multi-component programs in schools. Uh, as drug prevention professionals, we help schools to develop a drug policy, a substance policy that includes uh, four strategies. Uh, the first one are environmental measures on general well well-being. The second one is uh, a sound referral and care system with specialized organizations in their network for students who need help for a substance use problem. Uh, the third strategy consists of installing clear and concrete rules and procedures. And at last, an educational approach that focuses on attitudes, but also on social norms and misperceptions instead of only increasing knowledge. And I believe it's our job as prevention experts to talk with schools about what effective prevention is, because I think there is a lack of knowledge there on this topic. And EUPC can help us in del delivering this message. It's our responsibility as prevention professionals to make this theory understandable and easy to put in practice for schools. For example, in Flanders, we developed an evidence-informed guide from preschool till secondary school based on UPC that states very clearly which themes should and should not be discussed in class and which contents are effective based on simple do's and don'ts. Uh, another misperception of schools is that good prevention always costs a lot of time or money. But UPC shows that there are a lot of alternatives that are achievable for schools. So UPC can really help us in our advocacy because it shows that it's possible for schools to implement evidence-based interventions uh, with feasible efforts. And schools will have more preven pre preventive results when focusing on multi-component approaches instead of choosing one-shot interventions. So the time and money will be better spent. And I think that's a message we all like to hear. Great. Now, um, 
I think I go right ahead to Frederick, who comes also actually from the law enforcement center uh, um, sector. Frederick Rögeroth is senior advisor at the State Prevention Council, which is crime prevention at, uh, in Lower Saxony in Germany, located in the Ministry of Justice of Lower Saxony, which is one of the 16 federal states in Germany, I think territorial-wise the largest ones. And this State Prevention Council supports communities, which are then rather far away, to establish evidence-based prevention strategy on a local level specifically with the communities the, that care model, which you might know. And Frederick is responsible for running a register of evidence-based programs in Germany, the Green List, which is basically the inspiration or a sister registry of our exchange registry. And he trains local stakeholders in the CTC model. So Frederick represents kind of the po local policymaker sector that is engaging in EUPC advocacy. So Frederick, how can EUPC nudge local policymakers to favor evidence-based local policy options? And are there hidden needs or thinking patterns we need to address? You know this field well to answer these questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thank you, Gregor, and, and thanks for the for the invitation. And as you said, we have worked a lot in the, in the last years with um, local policymakers, but um, and it's important to make sure that I'm not one of this kind. So, so, so I'm talking about other people and other perceptions. And um, so, so what we have learned over the years is that there is uh, um, very important to consider that there are local specific decision-making cultures. So I think it's it's possible, and I, I will try to overgeneralize this a little bit to say there are at least in, in in Germany there are some common patterns of local decision makings, but I'm I'm sure that it's different in different countries, and this this could be the whole answer to say let's consider the, the local decision decision making culture, but but to to see I will take into account two aspects that I think that are little bit more common, at least in the German situation. The, the first one is that local policy making, decision making is much more consensus based and consensus oriented than the um, decision making on state on, or on federal level. So the people are cl more close together and they, they have some, they, they don't like to deviate too much from the from the cons already existing consensus. So, so if you are trying to educate single decision makers on say statewide uh, EUPC or other prevention trainings, you usually see the result that they come back to the community and don't be able to communicate what they have learned in these trainings, even if they are convinced after this, because they, they don't want to have these this conflicts within their, their own peer group. So this was one of the reasons we decided that we need to train the, the whole community coalition or the, the, the uh, a group of stakeholders in that community so that to make the, the, the group dynamics do the work to, to, to convince people. So I, I, I like to uh, um, remind an aspect that Ivan brought in that if you have local coalitions, local uh, prevention councils, groups of stakeholders already work together. I think this is a good starting point to educate them as a group about uh, some prevention principles and scientific based prevention. And then you don't have to convince every single person that it's maybe not open to this. Then, then you, if you're lucky, you have some some champions that will advocate in this group for, for the other ones. And I think this is a part of the, the, the reasons why models like CTC and other ones can work because they, they rely on this, on this dynamic. And, and the other aspect is that at least in the German situation, we see that local policymaker politicians are usually quite closely related to social service providers. So the, the prevention interventions in the communities are usually made by charities, by social welfare organizations, and politicians are quite close to them and mostly have some career before in these organizations and then change to, to, to policy and, 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 and back. And 
if the evidence-based policy options are in competition to that what the local uh, prevention providers are already providing, then they are opting against evidence-based uh, intervention and, and options, even if they may be open for this. So this is one of the reasons why we are work strongly with um, models where we do a needs gap resource analysis in this community first to or uh, enable them to do this, that they can um, see what are the, the specific gaps that they have in their existing service structure so that we can ask for or discuss about implementing new evidence-based um, interventions in the, in the gaps that are not uh, competing with the already existing prevention structure. So they are more open-minded to, to do this and to develop models where the existing social service providers can adopt this new intervention so make them to their own. So usually policymakers are wanting to do something positive for their community and they take this very literally. They want to do something positive also for these organizations working there. And if evidence-based prevention is only relying on providers that are outside of the community, they will not support this kind of options. But if you talk about something, I think the right word is community ownership of evidence-based intervention and programs and make this to a strategy. They are much more open-minded to do this. And I, I think this is a part that we need to develop a little bit more in the EUPC curriculum that uh, the strategies for developing community ownership of evidence-based uh, prevention programs that they that I think it makes much more easier for for open-minded uh, local policy makers to opt for this uh, for these programs if they see that they can serve also their, their existing providers with this. Great, great answer. Thank you, Frederick. Here comes a question by Byron Geist, our friend from Cyprus. What if advocates and policymakers have different interpretations of the same facts due to different world roots? Is this a specific question to, add to someone of us or? It to or you, it's it to you. It's, it's then to I me. put yeah. the questions to the other people. Ah, okay, 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 sorry. So yes, this is usually the case that, <laughs> that we have differing, different opinions on, on what about other facts. So um, I think our, our way is to, to, to work on local specific solutions also, to, to the work on local specific problem analysis to what is the problem here in this specific community, what are their specific prevention needs, what needs to be done in this community, and what are the available options that we have. This is why it's so important to have this list of evidence-based prevention programs where you see that there are a lot of different uh, prevention programs that could address this specific need or the specific problem and that they have a choice that it's not that we usually say there's only one single perception of a problem, there's only one single solution, but that we can offer them a menu of different options that are uh, evidence-based or more or less, and that they are still in the situation that they decide. Um, so, so I think this is uh, important to have in mind that they are decision makers. And if there's only one option, then they are not in their role as decision makers. And we need to support them in their role that they make decisions for the community and help them to make better decisions, but not take, them, uh, take the decision away from them. Excellent. Now I'd like to put some questions from the question and answers to everyone. There is one question put to Drin by David Bressfield, but which I would also extend to Maximilian because Germany is much more exposed to industry lobbying than other countries in Europe. The question was, can you comment on advocacy when there are strong multinational corporate interests lobby for unhealthy behaviors? So it's not only alcohol and drugs. Isn't it an important factor that must be recognized and dealt with. 
It certainly is. So thank you very much for the question. Um, my first encounter with lobbying was actually um, presenting a certain prevention approach in a circle of politicians and researchers when there was a rise in um, youth hospitalizations due to um, binge drinking in Germany. And one participant was invited from the beer brewing industry, which is very strong in Germany, and a very handsome, good looking person. And you know there were all these talks, and he had the last word, and he just said, "It's it's just not true." <laughs> he he pulled the Donald Trump style and just said, "You know all the facts are wrong," but he was very convincing, and everybody was like, "Oh, who's that handsome person?" and so on. And he said, "And we're doing so much in the field of prevention," and and he just made his statements, and and you know the way I I report this incident is I don't remember the scientists presenting at this event, but I certainly remember this lobby guy. <laughs> so it is very important to recognize that there are interest groups that may put more value on economic interests than you may put on the well-being and thriving of young individuals. And um, this needs to be incorporated into, your, incorporated into your strategy. I think a lot can be learned really from the history of tobacco regulation, because industry was going so far, they funded well, we have the same in, in the climate discussion at the moment, but there's a lot of funding of studies with the sole purpose of providing evidence that the mainstream is wrong and uh, to provide some uh, excuses for why um, there should be no more regulation, for example, or no more investment into actually effective uh, interventions that may reduce consumption. So, but it really boils down to the discussion about values and which values are more important. Because if the discussion is about um, liberalism and freedom of the market and so on, then you won't have a strong point. But if you um, succeed in emotionally connecting on a debate about health and such values and the development of children and so on, then it's much easier uh, to make your point. I think. Um, uh, it's really important, and especially in developing countries, I have learned that, that the European alcohol industry is, is making devastating efforts uh, in terms of advertisement and um, lobbying and so on. And this can be overwhelming to individuals. Um, so in such a case, I think without strong coalitions, it is difficult uh, to make a point. Rin, your point? Um, I was thinking that we often see uh, industry where when they want to participate in prevention, they want to say that, oh, we, this, I don't know, alcohol company, anything, we want to <clears throat> uh, fund a school program, mental health program, uh, and to, I think we need to be aware of that uh, and uh, where, what kind of programs or interventions we allow into uh, our schools and who is behind it. I think it, it, it doesn't always, um, <clears throat> uh, well, the credibility, they built their credibility. I think we have seen that a lot. I think that's one of the uh, uh, points. And I was thinking also that we have seen in Estonia as well, that it's, all, it's kind of useful to listen how they frame their, their uh, opinions or their <clears throat> views. And we can learn from that uh, where to like how they influence the pol uh, policymakers. And I think that learning from that is very useful. But yes, I agree with Max that definitely you need to uh, be aware, be proactive, and to uh, anticipate that the industry wants to be involved, as in interested in this uh, <clears throat> part. Excellent. Great. Now I have a question for any panelist to choose to answer if you want or not. This is from an anonymous attendee. Civil society advocacy, informed by the evidence, is an important, important part of a functioning democracy. Push and pull between elected politicians, civil servants, public servants, and civil society advocates leads to chance. However, civil society organizations funded by the state are often dissuaded from advocacy by civil servants and public servants from advocating for evidence-informed changes. Here might be the threat of defunding of the civil society organizations involved in advocacy. 
Do, I, do you have experiences of this problem or, or any strategies to address this problem? Because how can we be advocates when our actions may leave us without our job? Quite a long question, not, not, easy, not easy to answer. I may have some ideas, but just in case nobody else want, wants to contribute. Okay. Um, long story short, well, I think exis the existential dimension of such efforts is very important to acknowledge. And I think Frederick already contributed to this aspect when it's about you know, advocating for new approaches when all the local service providers do not provide them <laughs> and may, may lose their jobs and not be able to pay their mortgage. And this is, these are really real life important things to consider. Um, the other is the more institutional aspect of advocating maybe as a member of, of the government and so on. And I think a solution on this side is more like really, for example, joining interest groups or so societies like, for example, the European Society for Prevention Research and contributing and participating, for example, in the formulation of a statement, but not, you know, um, being or stepping on the stage visibly as a person. So because this is your right uh, in a democracy, at least to participate in civil society organizations and also contribute to their processes. But of course, you need to protect yourself. And sometimes it is it is very difficult if you're funded by uh, by the government uh, to be critical. Um, yeah, coming back to the other aspect, I think I really like the idea of, of Frederick, and and I've been talking about it as a kind of white label approach towards prevention programs. I, I really see the future in providing kind of white label prevention programs that can you know, that you can take and give your label and your brand and your logo and do some additions, although having the evidence base for the core aspects of it, that would be helpful, for example. Yeah. Now, a last question from our colleague Danilo, who says the EU drug strategy 20, the new one, 21-25, acknowledges EUPC and EDPQS and, and, and the UNODC, the National Standards on Drug Use Prevention, saying that it is, quote, important to disseminate these tools and advocate for evidence-based prevention and training among decision makers, opinion leaders and practitioners, and to allocate sufficient funding for such measures. Now, how do you see this? Useful? Not enough? And how can this be implemented? That's a typical question from an informed policymaker. We need an answer. Who dares? Frederick. <laughs> I, I'm not sure if, if I have a good answer for this. So <laughs> I, I, I like to, to come back to the to the question before uh, and maybe this 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 is also leads to to this question because uh, max already has pointed in in this direction how what kind of useful roles supranational organizations in this case like EUSPR can can play in this in this case so that this kind of controversial teams i i um, remember the the paper on ineffective uh, prevention uh, approaches by by EUSPR can help in in the local um, the local organizations to to make the point on on controversial teams that I can can say that this this is also a legitimate point by an by an organization that it's more uh, uh, has the mandate to do this and it's not only our own perception and it's not our own opinion on this 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 is what is what is the the uh, main consensus in the in the scientific field in this in this question? I, and I, I think this this leads also to to the other question that we need more policy briefs of condensed um, information about what are the, the core scientific results in some fields that are uh, built in in a way that 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 it can can be used as a as a pass two in in different situations that that you have this. Uh, 
have this legitimated from an from an uh, bigger organization to to advocate for this and this is maybe we can we can develop more and on more specific teams that we have done in um, before can I add I, I do agree with Frederick I think you answered uh, quite thoroughly I think these tools give us in our each country's credibility that as you said it's not only our own but it's a common acknowledgement that this is needed this is something that we need to go towards to but i think also that uh, these tools um, enable us um, discussions that that we we can use these as fast when we facilitate discussions and we we need to get forward and without these it's much harder I also have a thought, um, like if you, if you take a market perspective, what I have learned in Germany and in other countries is offering the EUPC on the basis of the assumption that there might be a real need, these people might actually like to learn something, <laughs> opens an important door because the reality is, for example, in Germany, you have all these institutions that are by definition have, having expertise and, and responsibilities, but people working there might not necessarily have because um, they, they've been studying something, maybe public health, but maybe something else. And they, but they, are, they are now, you know, ought to be experts, but they are not yet. And offering some guidance and some training, and the UPC is just a, an example for that, is, is really important. If you acknowledge ignorance, then everything gets better. And what we experienced here, that there's a real demand. So we had, we had far more than 100 participants in a very short period of time during the pandemic in our seminars. Um, and people were very grateful. And, they, and most of them were actually already experts. But this is something they are defined as. But becoming an expert is a different thing. <laughs> yeah. So this is why I, I see it as a, something encouraging, actually. Yeah. Yeah. M maybe to add something. I, I know, Gregor, we are, we are closed, but to, to make a point for the EUPC, <laughs> because for us, the, the, the importance of the EUPC curriculum is that it's not coming from us. So, so, so we have also the, the task to coordinate different stakeholders on a state level and usually we have the problem they have we have no common ground and um, we, they, they don't want to be on also on, on our side we need to have some some common ground and, and the EUPC helps us to communicate that it's not from us it's not about coming to our side this is the this is the the, the, the side that, or is it's an offer to 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 talk about things and to to make things clear for, for other stakeholders and not only talk about our approaches but also take into account the other approaches and say let's use the EUPC as our common ground i think this is the most important uh, achievement of the EUPC in our situation i thank you very much frederick very nice to say that very good idea now Let's listen to the concluding remarks by our, direct, our director, Alexis, for the remaining time. Thank you very much for your great answers to very interesting questions. Alexis? Yes, uh, thank you, Gregor. Uh, thank you all. I, I think this was a fantastic webinar. And uh, I would say that uh, I invite all the speakers for whenever you want. And please don't hesitate to take the initiative to have a further discussion. I really uh, loved your, your comments and presentation. Uh, Maximilian, uh, you probably know or don't know that uh, we have been working and produced our own theory of change about what the EMCDDA is trying to aim at a few years ago. So I think plenty of things we, as I say, we have in common and that uh, we, we, we really need and want to discuss with you in the coming months. Uh, I, I've been uh, looking at the list of participants and I want uh, once more before to conclude thanks and say hello to all our friends from all over the world. I've seen some of them uh, that I have not seen for a long time, like uh, some friends from Georgia and other countries. Uh, we have uh, very famous uh, colleagues uh, participating. One of them I had uh, the pleasure and the privilege to see him again after many years, it's Elisardo Beconia, 
who is from Spain, who is in the list. Uh, it could be one. It should be one of the speakers for one of the next webinars. Uh, we had a fantastic uh, meeting a few weeks ago in Spain online. So um, two or three concluding remarks. Uh, even if I would love comment each uh, presentation, don't worry, I will not do, we don't have time, but uh, uh, there, there are, I would start first with uh, one of the last points of uh, Frederic, which is uh, the consensus which I think it's always easier at local level than at regional or national one. Uh, but but I, I think it's extremely important that the challenge for, for the advocacy, but also for the, those who promote the, the scientific evidence. I don't mean that you don't promote scientific evidence, but you are doing advocacy, we don't. Uh, but when we work together is that you, we need to be ready to accept that the consensus will not always be the highest possible or the strongest uh, ambitious consensus. So this means when we try to work with local consensus, well, we need to be ready to accept the results, if, even if some of us may have more ambitious expectations. I, I think what, what is important with those projects is that um, I think that's the really the perfect illustration of uh, what I, I suggested before, which is when uh, I'm thinking about two meetings I've been involved. Um, one, one was uh, about a, a rock or musical festival uh, with some local stakeholders and authorities. Uh, and the other was, uh, was in a municipality or in a city where there was uh, a new drug consumption room to be open. And it was not yet sure if this would have a, a really a, a positive legal status or not. And, uh, and in both cases, I think we, we have been in, the, in a position to, to, to give upon request additional scientific evidence. Uh, but in fact, the request was more based on emotions and fears about what would be the risks if we do differently. What are the risks if we if we use uh, EUPC? But if the conclusion is that uh, we should, uh, for instance, include uh, uh, some pill checking in the in the music festival because there have been a few dead cases in the past, and uh, even if it is not officially allowed to consume, uh, to get this uh, public health approach or harm reduction, but it's not only harm reduction actually. It's really the values, as Maximilian was uh, saying. If the values are that we want to preserve the lives of our children, maybe at local level, it's more easy to have some discussions. And if we can make use of the evidence, if there is evidence, to show that, uh, OK, there are negative emotions, potentially, and some fears. And decision makers, they need to, to assume their responsibilities. It's not always easy. You, they need to take some risks. Uh, scientific evidence can be useful, but, but only if, if we give a place to these emotions. Now, if, we have a, if there is a problem of values, that is always much more challenging. This I will not comment further. But for, for me, the, what I have observed many times is the fact that uh, if we manage to articulate emotions, the facts, the scientific evidence, and, and we, we can put them into perspective of the risks uh, and the decisions, um, uh, I, I think we sometimes may have better chances. I really believe that if we don't recognize the risks and if we don't recognize the emotions from the side of those who are more reluctant to innovate or to change, we, we can try to kill that with knowledge, but it never works. And I don't even think that's that's a useful approach. Of course, I don't mean that's what you are doing, but, but I think overall, this, this requires also a lot of uh, different talents from all of us and to, to join the force. So, so th this was the first point. A second experience that I, I've, I've noticed, observed, and I experienced myself some, some many years ago, is, uh, is that sometimes, uh, when I am, a, I am a psychologist, a clinical psycholo psychologist from background, when I try to speak with pharmacists uh, to, to promote the, the, the kits with the syringes in, in Brussels region, 
a psychologist had no chance to be taken really seriously into consideration by the association of pharmacists, or at least you make it the challenge very difficult. So we use the peer approach. So peer approach is not only for and with people using drugs. Uh, it was using the pharmacist of the La Goutte d'Or in France, where they launched the initiative to have the steri kit or the steri box being produced. And uh, when we managed to invite one pharmacist to speak to other pharmacists, suddenly the, the look at him and the, the attention they paid to him was very different. Also, uh, uh, we, are, we are very lucky that we have EUPC because one of the things we, we, we need to continue to do is uh, to share positive experiences from elsewhere. And again, there it's uh, not only to sell success story, I would say, again, it's more risk reduction or fear reduction. So if we can give facts about the fact that uh, for instance, decriminalization in Portugal has not led to an increase in drug use like everybody who was against was pretending 20 years ago. If we have a scientific evidence about the positive results, you can help to, to then start discussing about something much more uh, concrete about what can we do together. Um, so uh, I, I really liked what you mentioned about labor. I will not discuss, but I think uh, uh, as CDD, we are also contributing to labeling the best practice and we could imagine uh, uh, further cooperation on this. Um, uh, a last comment before the, 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 my final statement or proposal. Uh, I think what has changed, uh, and EUPC fully supports that, uh, is that um, we, we should involve the peers, uh, whoever those peers are. Uh, and I, I frequently have to remind um, some decision makers that, uh, uh, you know, when you are 25 years old, for those who are 14, you are already an old guy. Uh, and so if you are 60 like me, there is no chances that I can pretend I can understand the way they feel, the way they don't feel, the way maybe they are depressed because of COVID and the lockdown and so on. So. To, to, to keep this belief that we know, we have knowledge, and then we need to balance on the head of the others who should receive this uh, fantastic knowledge. EUPC helps to break that, but we need to make the case every time more to make sure that either the students from the school or people using drugs or any kind of substance, well, the clients of the services, uh, they are a fundamental a partner element of the of the of the program, and then uh, what what uh, what uh, I'm I'm happy to say, and also I'm sorry, I, I, I really could not be the first five minutes of the meeting. I, I've not stopped meetings today since eight this morning, um, but I want to say that first, as I said, that's a top priority for us. We have the new plateau project uh, that is supporting uh, ASAP and that is supporting uh, the EUPC. Um, we, we, we want to build with you uh, uh, the future distance learning and capacity building in prevention uh, uh, today, but also in the future. Uh, I think we need distance learning. One of the key features for us is the community of practice. Um, and, and also the, the important point, I, I, I take this from what Maximilian said, is um, at the MCDDA, we, we try not to be too much institutionally arrogant, which means that we don't pretend we are the experts who know it all. And uh, we are very much aware that our expertise is only depending or can only be judged uh, if you look at our capacity to mobilize experts from the field and from the academy. And so uh, your presence here is a, is a, is a proof, an evidence of that. Uh, I think that for, for the, the future of capacity building on demand reduction, because I think ultimately it should not be only on prevention, we, we need to have more co-production. Uh, what, what we managed to contribute with the UPC and ASAP, uh, I think we, we are very lucky. You gave us this opportunity to do that with you. Uh, we try to, to give support, we, we try to provide some added value, 
Uh, and I want to tell you clearly that we are fully committed to continue to work with you and to increase uh, the, the community of practice uh, on those practices, uh, on those values, and on those methodologies. And I hope that uh, this year we will have other webinars on more specific uh, topics. And why not one day, uh, maybe not this year, uh, but uh, before next year, uh, to have one about uh, EUPC and rock festivals, for instance, uh, because I can tell you that the, the meeting with local decision makers that I attended one year ago, just before the, the start of the pandemic, was a bit challenging one. This, I, I can say, was not an easy one. So thank you very much. <laughs>